Okay, we, we have, we finished the books of Samuel. And if you look, we're looking at the books of Samuel, who is the dominant figure in the books of Samuel? David. David. David's yes. the, the sort of the dominant, is the dominant figure, even though it, it starts before David, because yeah. it starts with the prophet Samuel, the last, the last judge. Uh, and we've got a time with Saul, but even Saul's story is so intertwined with David, it's, it's almost impossible to talk about Saul without talking about David, because the, the connection is so, so strong. And, and if, we, if we look at, at David's trajectory as we, we go through the books of um, Samuel, what, what is sort of the arc of David's story? What, how would you describe the, the progression? And remember, we're talking about a, a writer who is shaping the story. So he's not, he, yeah, he's not just writing down facts. You know, he's shaping it into a narrative. And the narratives have meaning, meanings. have points. So, what? Shepherd. Okay, he starts. starts as a shepherd. He he is starting there. What's so we start as as a shepherd. What's the trick? Where does it go from there? He goes to the king and plays because he has demons. Okay, so are we? What direction are we talking? Uh, okay, we're moving up. Yeah. Okay, so local boy. That's good. Makes good. <laughs> Although we have right at the beginning, the shepherd part isn't just he's a shepherd. No, he's, that's when he first finds out that he's going to He's be annoying. Mm -hmm. Even though as we look at the story, he doesn't seem to, to know that. Mm -hmm. I mean, as we look at the story, he doesn't say, well, you know, I was anointed. You know, when I was a teenager, I was anointed. He probably didn't uh, even so register I mean, with the Well, felt, you know, it, the, it's, it's kind of interesting, though, that we don't, we don't have that. It yeah. doesn't seem to be part of these individual stories that are being woven together, that an awareness of what David's going to become. Maybe, and that's got to be intentional because the writer could have certainly injected that into the story. He sh he's the one shaping it, but he chooses not to do it. So, but we've got this trajectory, and maybe, maybe we it, it would diminish the story if he knew from yeah. the very beginning this is my destiny because he's reacting to things. And at times in the story, even though we, the reader, know it's going to come out all right because we know his destiny, he doesn't. And therefore, he doesn't react as, oh, it's going to be fine. Oh, I don't need to worry about it. Oh, Saul's not yeah. going to kill me. Oh, I don't need to. Goliath is, oh, I don't know. I don't worry about it. You know, we don't have that in the story. Uh, so we've got him moving up. Yeah. Small town boy moving up. But we know his destiny. We know it anyway because... We're yeah, we're reading it, and we know it's about it's like knowing George Washington. Gee, will he be a will he be president? I'm not sure. Yeah, I think we pretty much know. So the the trajectory is going up. What? Tell me more. Then he becomes a like a soldier. Later, okay, uh, becomes a soldier. Yeah, and then okay, he good soldier. Sometimes. <laughs> well, good, <laughs> good, good. He's a good soldier. Yeah. You know, he because good soldiers win. Right? Yeah. Good warrior. Because he wins. Even when he's doing things that we might, you know, with yeah. in the twenty first century think is a good thing to do. He's certainly good at what he does. Yes, that's right. Okay. He's absolutely. good good at what he does. He's a good warrior. So his trajectory is going up. Going up. What what else happens with David? So we we're, we're still moving up. Okay. Well he's hunts for Saul. I mean he does all the fighting for Saul. Okay, he's fighting for Saul. And you he know. meets his son, and they be Jonathan, and they become really good friends. He and David become buddies. Okay. Now Saul is in here, and what is yes. Saul doing with respect to David? He's now getting jealous. Okay, he's jealous of David and wants to Kill eliminate him. him, but does he catch David? No. No. No, so David... Still is moving, moving up, and what what eventually happens if he's moving up? Does he reach a peak? Yes. Does he reach a top, the top of the mountain? He stops. Yes. Depending on God. Well, okay, he reaches the top, and Saul, the great antagonist in the story, David's great antagonist, he dies in battle, and David doesn't even have to kill him. You know, somebody else, Philistines kill him. So Saul is gone. David becomes 
king. king of Judah, then becomes king of Israel, and David ha is feeding the people, right? And Jesus. what else is he doing? Well, he's treating them well. He's treating them well. What else does he do? He messes up. Well, before. Oh, okay. We're talking about him at the top. Top oh, of the heap. Okay. He, he, he city. what's that? Builds his city. Builds his city. What else? I mean, we're checking, checking boxes, right? Mm -hmm. Good to the people. Practices justice. Finds himself a capital city. And he still finds underneath all that, he still goes raiding against them. Well, he's still raiding because that's the way things were. Yeah. Then. So he's, but we're checking boxes, right? So what other boxes are we going to check? He moved the ark. He moves the ark. Yes. You know, the religious, the great religious symbol for the, for the people. The ark that guided them through the wilderness. You know, that's why it's in tent. It's in a tent. He brings that ark, boom, into his city, which is the city of David. You know, brings it into the city. All right? What, what enemy has been a big deal through the Philistines. whole book of the books of Samuel? Philistines are first, first Samuel. Philistines are the big enemy. Man, they were a problem at the end of Judges with, you know, with Samson. The Philistines, what does David do with the Philistines? Defeated. Defeats them. They're done. You know, outside of those stories we looked at at the end of 2 Samuel, you know, that were stories that seem out of place, you know, we don't, the Philistines don't show up again. Um, you know, they, they're going. And the writer says they go back. You know, so they are out of the land. So David, militarily, politically, socially, religiously, he is on the top of the heap, right? What happens? He falls. Okay, he falls. And what, as the writer is telling it, now if we were reading this as, impartial historians and looking at the life of David, we could say maybe a lot of different things, reasons for his fall, you know, but the writer tells us what the problem is. What, what is the problem? Bathsheba. Okay, the, the, well, Bathsheba becomes part of the problem, becomes almost he, a symptom of the he problem. He stops consulting God. Okay, he stops consulting God and he stops doing what? He stops, he stops doing what kings do. He stops doing what kings do, he stops consulting God. And what now we're talking about sliding. And, and you know, as the writer writes it, it's not like, oh, it's a path. In most of our lives, you know, trajectories are yeah. like this, you know, up and down. And up, you know, but this writer isn't going to do one of these. You know, it's up, and then when David goes down, it's down. It is down. And it starts with this, and how does the the ball, the snowball, pick up momentum? David's lies become more frequent as he tries to cover up. His lies become more frequent. His cover-ups become more frequent. He knows exactly what he's he's doing. Other people know what he's doing. Joab, Nathan knows what he's doing, and what ends up happening as a consequence of these really bad decisions that, that David makes with respect ultimately to God, what ends up happening to David? He Does he rebound? He becomes very, very weak. Right. He in doesn't it, he yeah. doesn't rebound. You know, it it's it, he's sliding downhill. And what are some of the what are some of the things that we meet as he goes downhill? Some of the some of the stories that are the downhill stories. Oh Lord, have mercy! He's got trouble in his own house with his sons. With his sons, his sons are a nightmare. You know, his Amon and and uh, Absalom are are terrible. You know, problems. And but all of them are trying to manipulate. They're all manipulating David. And David doesn't seem to either be aware or doesn't seem to really care. He doesn't fight it. What's that? He doesn't fight it. He, he doesn't fight it. Yeah. He, in fact, the, the only thing, people have to push him. Joab has to push him. Good gracious. Yeah. When Absalom, he defeats the, the great threat to his reign. You know, Absalom has taken power. It's not like David is fighting. He's taken power. David's out of the country. You know, 
and, and he defeats Absalom. And part of defeating Absalom is Absalom's got to go. And Absalom is killed. And David, you know, his armies won this tremendous victory. And how does David respond? Ab- Absalom, my Absalom. You know, and until Joab says, you've got to get out there. The army is getting depressed because you're so, you know, you're so depressed. They fought for you. They risked their life for you. And you act like they lost. You know, you can't do that. So what does David do? All right. And he goes out and does it, you know. And he, but he, then he has to fight another. He has another civil war where there's a northern tribe. So David is, ends up sliding, you know, downhill. And, and we, the reader, know why. You know, we're not talking about political reasons. We're not talking about military reasons. We're not talking about social reasons. Why does David... Because he isn't consulting God. Because he isn't consulting God. And he has disobeyed him. Okay. And that's where we get... and we. The, the last, at the end of, of uh, Second Samuel, we got some paws and tails, uh, little stories that have just sort of been included in a psalm, but it doesn't, it, it, it really seems a little out of place, but they're there, mm-hmm. you know, David's stories. So we, we leave Second Samuel and start entering the kings, the books of the kings, and that's what we're going to be looking at. Uh, the books of the kings, and when we and the books of the kings will be the the book from the same perspective of the writer, whether it's the same hand or not, who knows? But it's certainly the same perspective as the one who wrote Second Samuel. Now there are certain things that we we learn from Second Samuel that we wanna we wanna think about, we wanna uh, remember as we look at the book of the kings because it tells us the perspective of the writer. Uh, first, we see Lord used a lot, yes. a, a lot, which tells us, and Lord, even when we looked at Genesis, tended to be a word that was associated with the South, with the Southern, with Abraham, and Abraham's stories are Southern stories. Jacob's stories are not, they're Northern, but Abraham's stories tended to have locations in, in the South. And those were the words, that's where we run into Lord a lot, those four letters. And we see Lord a lot here in the books of Samuel, books of the Kings. And, and I think they're coming, the writer is, is coming from a southern perspective. In other words, he's writing in Judah. He's writing uh, either for the court or for the king, or, but his perspective is a Judean perspective, not an Israel perspective. He isn't, he isn't looking at Ephraim. He's looking at Judah because that's the country where he, he lives. So his perspective tends to be a southern perspective. That's important because eventually the, the capital of the southern kingdom is going to be Jerusalem. And as we look at the books of the kings, nothing from the north is going to be good. Nothing when the kingdoms divide, and they will. Nothing related to Israel is going to be good. They're never going to have a good king according to the writer, ever, ever. All the kings of Israel obey him. Uh, primarily because they aren't worshiping God in Jerusalem, where you're supposed to worship God. So they don't, they have to be God. They build another temple. You know, to worship God in their own country, that's wrong from that perspective. So in other words, they were expected to travel to well, Jerusalem to, to worship God? The, the right, from the writer's perspective, now remember, when yeah. I talk about anything other, from the writer's perspective, yes, yes. Wow. And they don't have a Davidic king. They're ruled not by a Davidic king. They're ruled by other dynasties. That's wrong. Yeah. You know, so coming from their perspective, anything about the North is going to be bad. So expect that as we look at this. What the North does is tends to be, tends to be bad. It's, the focus is on, going to be on Jerusalem. It's going to be on the southern kingdom. Eventually, it's going to be on the temple. Not as strong as it is in the books of Chronicles. So, the books of the Chronicles, that's all temple-centered. That, that the whole thing is focused on, on the temple worship. But this is going to be far more related to the south, the southern kingdom. Where would okay. we look for the northern perspective if we wanted to Doesn't it? Don't know. Okay. I mean, we don't have ancient works that that reflect that. And and part of the reasons we don't have one, it's you don't have a huge amount of written material anyway. 
just because writing, you don't have anything to write on. So you don't have a huge amount of written material anyway. The material that they're using is very fragile. You know, they're writing on reeds. That, they, they just don't last. You know, so it's, it's, it's almost, you could almost say it's rare to have ancient materials written. Something else that's part of it is that both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom are going to be conquered. And the conquerors are not, are not going to be interested in preserving the history of the people they conquered. And, and so a lot of what, what might have been written, and we don't know because it's not there, but even if it was written when the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom, it, it would be in their interest to destroy history. Because if you don't destroy it, they have something to, can, to build on. You know, you, can, you have something to coalesce. And especially, and we're going to see this later, because we're going to go through the fall of Israel in the books of the kings. Um, one of the things that the, both the Assyrians and the Babylonians did, this is different than what the Persians and the Romans did later. What the Babylonians and the Assyrians did when they conquered a, a territory, they, they tended to ship the leadership of the territory someplace else. They'd move the leadership. They didn't ship everybody out. You couldn't do that. You couldn't depopulate it. But you should take the leadership, because most people are just so poor. You know, they, they just want to survive. They don't care who's king. They just want to have enough to feed themselves for the day. But you, they would take the elite and move them into another part of the empire. Well, strategically, that makes a lot of sense. Because if, if you're taking the leadership of Judah or the leadership of Israel, you're taking them out of Israel and moving them somewhere else, way to the east, that leadership feels no sense of loyalty to the land where they're living now because they've just been transported there. They'll ship that leadership into, into Palestine, into Israel, well, the people that they shipped in there, they don't feel any loyalty to the gods of Israel. I mean, they're coming from another part of the empire. So as a way to maintain control, that's what both the Babylonians and the Assyrians did to, to keep control of their empire. The, the Persians and the Romans will do something different. They want to keep the leadership in the land because they hope the leadership will support them. And if the leadership supports them, then they don't have to worry about the people getting, getting antsy. And uncomfortable. So there's a different philosophy on how to manage a multicultural empire. But that's what the Assyrians and the Babylonians did. And that's what we're going to see here. That's why they talk about the exile. Because that's what these two ancient people used to do with conquered territory. They would ship the, the leadership, which includes the religious leadership, they'd ship them out. Ship them someplace where there's no affinity to the land. People didn't care. You know, so you wouldn't have to put down rebellion because they, what are, you're not fighting for your home. You're fighting for somebody else's home because you've only been here for a few years, not even a generation. So that's, that, anyway, that's what we'll see happen. Now, of course, the writer is going to interpret all theologically. This is all going to be theological. This isn't going to be political or military. It's going to be theological. It's going to involve God. God is going to enable, cause it, enable it to happen. Uh, so, but we'll get into to that. Uh, in a little bit. Right at the beginning when we start First Kings, who's mentioned? David. As soon as we get there. King David. Okay, we got King David. Now, we've come, come through the books of Samuel where David was the, big, was the big cheese in the books of Samuel. What is David's condition? He's very right old. Very okay, old. He, is, he is incredibly, incredibly old. In fact, he is so old, what do they do? They, they, they get an ogre. He is, he is really old, and evidently his circulation is bad because David... Not there yet. He's cold. He is cold. He gets cold. So they get this young, young girl, young, and, and she's beautiful. And what, what is the purpose of this young girl? Lie with him and keep him warm. All her job is, is to keep... David warm. Now, I think that this may be David. David has now reached his lowest point because here this great warrior who was admired so much, and, and the, the crux, 
the thing that brought the problem, that, that demonstrated that he had turned away from God and was trusting himself, was his lusting after this beautiful woman he saw. Now he is a old, old man pathetic man. old man, and he's got a young beautiful girl woman like who's beautiful <laughs> just to keep him warm. Yeah. You know, he is, he is now this doddering old man. Uh, and that's, that's now David's condition. So it's, he doesn't, David's not rebounding. You know, he is not a lady's man. You know, at this age, he is kind of sad. And again, he's had problems with his family. Mm-hmm. What one, happens? One thing after another. So here's this doddering old man who needs this beautiful girl to keep him warm because he gets cold. Not a shocker. What ends up happening? Well, another son. Another son. Uh, another son. Is that how you say that? Yes. Adonijah. Adonijah. Uh, he's another he, son. We know he's a son because... He's Absalom's brother, was Absalom's younger brother. And, and what does Adonijah do? He claims the throne. Okay, he claims, he claims the throne. Now, what's kind of interesting is, he's not, when he claims the throne, he's not alone in claiming it, right? No. Okay, who's with him? him? Joab. Joab, and who is Joab? Okay, he's the commander of David's army. And Joab's been important because in the past, Joab has done what? Kept David's secrets. And well, he's kept David's secrets because he knew with Uriah what David was up to. Yeah. What else about Joab? He killed a lot of people. He killed a lot of people, a lot of people in revenge. You know, Abner, Amasa, he's, he killed. Absalom. Absalom. So he didn't back, he didn't support Absalom during Absalom's rebellion. He stayed with David and in fact pushed David to be like a king. You know, but, so, but now Joab has, is backing uh, Adonijah. And Adonijah, it, it doesn't appear here that Adonijah is rebelling, right? Because it, it's He's certainly declaring himself king, but later we're going to see that Solomon does the same thing. So it's almost like, you know, he's not trying to take power from David. He's establishing himself as king. the successor. Yes. You know, that David's an old man. He ain't going to be around long. You know, I'm going to take the reins of government. You know, I, he can't do it anymore. I'm going to take the reins of government. He can be in retirement. I'm not going to kill him. But he ain't going to be king anymore. Okay, so he, he doesn't, I don't know, we've seen this before, that we've had kind of a civil war as a result. Because Joab is there, and Abathar is there, right, who is one of the priests that, again, backed David, you know, with the, in the Absalom rebellion. But who doesn't support him? Zadok's a priest. Zadok doesn't support him. And Nathan the prophet and Benaha. Benaha doesn't support him either. So we've got these three guys that don't support uh, Adonijah, but you've got two major players that do. Now, what does Adonijah do? He didn't invite them. Okay. He's, yes. he's, he's having a feast. And it says he's having a feast in a place called In Rogal. And, and that's a spring really, really close to Jerusalem. So it's not like when, we, when Absalom went to Hebron, which is someplace else. And did, this is, David's in Jerusalem. This is all happening in and around. This is like a suburb. It's, it's a spring. Jerusalem, and I think I've said this before, Jerusalem is on top of a mountain. And it's a walled city. Good for protection if you're being attacked. That's what you want. You want a walled city on a mountain because it's hard to get to. The trouble with a walled city on a mountain is if you're facing a siege, 
Not only are you going to run out of food, but before you run out of food, you're going to run out of water. So you're going to have to have springs to feed the city if it's sitting on top of a mountain. And this was one of the springs that fed the, the city. So there was, there was there were pipes, and they were sophisticated, feeding the, providing water to, to this walled city. He's there, feast, and, and we know what he's going to do. What's he going to do? At this feast. He's going to do sacrificial stuff. He's going to do sacrificial things because it's going to be at that feast that he's going to do what? Claim the throne. He's going to claim the throne. Again, this doesn't seem like the same thing that happened with uh, Absalom. Doesn't sound like he's rebelling. It's more like, you know, my dad, because even the, the writer even says one of the reasons he feels this way is that he and his dad have always gotten along. So it's not like he's against David or undermining David. You know, in fact, later we're going to see he shows a lot of respect to David um, and David's decision. So it doesn't seem like a rebellion, but it does sound like he wants to be the one to receive the power. So he's going to be, they, they call it a regent. You know, he's going to be sort of a regency while his dad is, is still alive. His dad, you know, is going to be kind of quasi-king, but he's going to have the power, and when his dad dies, he'll ascend to the throne. Okay, so this is what he's going to do, declare at this banquet. But we've got three people that are on the outside, right, that aren't part of this. One of whom is Nathan. And what does Nathan do? Because Nathan isn't invited. Uh, Benaha isn't invited. And Solomon's not invited. Now, we, we, we've heard the name Solomon before, but we haven't, it just, his name was mentioned. And Solomon is who? Who is Solomon? The brother of Solomon. He's David's son. Another son by another wife. Just like Adonijah is a son. In fact, an older son. You know, Adonijah is a son, so was Absalom, so was Amnon. They were all sons of David, so was Solomon. Solomon is the son of David and Bathsheba, one of David's wives. So, so we've got Solomon. He's not invited to this party either, okay? So what does this coron, sort of this coronation where he announces, I am going to follow my dad. What does Nathan then decide to do? Go to Bathsheba and have her go to camp. Now, with the situation. yes. Now, remember how David's been described, because I think this what ends up happening here is again kind of a pathetic. You know, reflects as much on David as it does anything else. He goes to Bathsheba, and what does he tell Bathsheba? What does he see the want king in his bedroom? Yeah, see. go and see, go and see the king, your husband. Yeah, and this is what I want you to. And and he even prefaces it. How how does he preface this with Bathsheba? I'm talking to you, Bathsheba, for your sake, for your sake and the sake of your son. You know, I've got you and your boy in mind, and this is why I'm telling you. Okay, go see David. And what do you tell David? What should you tell David? You've heard it. Uh, okay. I've, the son is setting himself as yes. the king. Yeah. Adonijah is, is setting himself as the successor. That he's going to, he's establishing himself as, as king. You know, so he's going to follow you. Uh, and, and he's got called this party, but he hasn't invited certain people you know, to this party. And, and what, what else does he say t- that I want you to tell him that's, that's really important? That Solomon should be king. Yeah, and, and why should Solomon be king? Because you made a promise. Because you made a promise. David, Adonijah is about to declare himself king. And he hasn't invited some important people to his party. But you know, David, you promised that Solomon was going to be king. Now, okay, did David make that promise anywhere in 2 Samuel? I don't remember reading. Uh, No, Uh, no. 
He never made that promise. Never. That promise doesn't exist. So what is Nathan telling Bathsheba to do? Lie. Lie. Go to David and lie. And tell him that you promised that Solomon would be king. The assumption is David's going to say, yeah, I guess I did. I don't remember it. But that's what, he, that's what Nathan is going to have. But, you know, if you tell him, if you tell him, he may say, huh, huh, you got an interest in this, don't you? Uh-huh, your boy being king, you know, maybe I should question the fact that all of a sudden you remember me saying to you that he's going to be king. Now, Bathsheba, you tell him that, okay? And then, what am I going to do as Nathan? I'm going to come in. As soon as you tell him that, that you promised to make Solomon king and he's doing this, oh, I don't remember that, I'm going to come into the room. And what am I going to say? He's going to say that he did say this. Yeah, I'm going to say, will you talk it? It's, it's, you know, it strikes me. One of the, one of the, the television shows I, I loved when it was on and I still watch reruns is Seinfeld. This sounds like something on a Seinfeld episode. You know, you're going to tell him that you promised to make Solomon king. I could see Jerry at, the, at, the, at months and then George come in and say, were you talking about how you promised to make him king? There was, a, what, uh, there was an episode about a race. You know, were you talking about that race that you won? Oh yeah, I remember it. We haven't seen each other for years. Uh, that's, what he, that's what Nathan's doing, right? So he's setting up to do what? What is, he, what is he setting David up for in this little story? He and, he and Bathsheba, and he's taking the leadership to on this. To make Solomon king. To make Solomon king. You know, and he's going to do it by fooling David. This doddering old man who needs a young woman to keep him warm at night. They are going to pull the wool over this, this old man's mm -hmm. eyes. And do they do? Do they do it? Yes. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed, they do it. Even though David never made that promise. And the writer isn't stupid. The writer knows that he hasn't written it in the story. You know, if, if he had, it'd be different, but he hadn't put it in the story. So we, the, we the reader, have no other, we can't say, well, maybe he did, he just didn't mention it. No, he mentioned everything we need to know. This is Nathan and Bathsheba, particularly Nathan, fooling poor old pathetic King David. And King David not only buys the story, but what does he decide he's going to, they should do? Um. Now, do what now? We're gonna, we're gonna go. We got, we still got a priest left, right? Zada is still around. He hasn't gone to the party either because he wasn't invited. Uh, so we're gonna get Zada. You, you guys are gonna go to another spring right around Jerusalem because that's what it is. You will go to another spring on the other side of town, and while they're having the party. What, what will happen to Solomon? Get He's going to be anointed. The oil is going to be poured on his head. On his head. Interesting, uh, Adonijah is going to declare himself king. He really doesn't talk about anointing the oil being poured. You know, because that makes you the crystals. That makes you the, the, the one chosen. And, and so the writer doesn't want to suggest that he's, you know, he's being anointed. Because now you've got two anointed kings. It's only going to be Solomon. He's going to be the only one anointed. I was going to say, how do they unanoint the other? He, he, does, because he wasn't, he wasn't anointed. anointed. He wasn't anointed. So you don't have to unanoint. <laughs> unanoint. <laughs> you don't have to get a towel and dry him off. <laughs> you know. <laughs> okay. But that was a big deal. Yeah. Remember in, in Samuel, you know, that that's why, in the books of Samuel, that's why when the guy comes with, um, uh, with the word that he had uh, killed. Uh, uh, Ash, uh, Ashbael, the and or that he had killed Saul, 
uh, that David had him killed because he had raised his hand against God's anointed. You, you're not supposed to do that. So Abijah wasn't so many, so Adonijah. Many, so many of the stories that we're, we're reading about sort of parallel other stories that were similar, like the sure. two brothers, the one left with his inheritance, okay, and the other one stayed, and then sure. he came back. And said, you know, there's two brothers, and, you know, and it just seemed like it's... What does that tell you? The history is following the same thing. The thing, certain things never change. Yeah. You know, you Space still have brothers that are rivals. Mm -hmm. You know, that you still have problems inside of families. You still have people jockeying who who will inherit dad's money. You know, you, 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 you have, nothing has changed. You know, you have still have betrayals. You still have, you know, this the same sort of things. Now, this, though, they're putting in a theological context. You know, so even though this is a sleazy way to do it, you know, who's going to end up being king? Solomon. And Solomon is the one that God wants to be king. You know, so we, as we read it, even though he is not explicitly being here, although David uses a lot of God language, in this, this is, must be the will of God. You know, this is you know, that that God is is moving this story, and that sometimes God moves moves stories in ways that we look at and say, "Whoa, you know, that this doesn't this doesn't sound good." I mean, they're lying to him, but God is still moving the story. It's still moving towards what God wills. So, what ends up happening with Solomon? Gets anointed as king. He gets anointed as king, and what what happens when he's anointed as king? Is it a quiet anointing? No. Heck no. Not only is anointed as king, what else happens to him? You anoint him as king. Well, first, even before he's anointed, because this is a, this is this is strategic. He's going to Gihon, right? How is he going to get there? How is Solomon going to get there? David. On David's donkey. On David's donkey. Why is that important? Because it's showing everybody that David picked This is David's, and he's going there, and they're going to anoint him, and after the anointing, where are they going to put him? On the throne. He's going to be on the throne. So... He, we've, we've, not only is he showing David's you know, authority riding in on David's animal and being anointed, oil is being poured on him, something Adonijah didn't want to do, didn't do, you know, but Solomon is, so he is now going to be king. He is sitting on David's throne. There's a lot of celebration going on, right? Who hears this celebration? Now, understand, both of them, both of these things are happening in Jerusalem. It's not like one is happening in Hebron. You know, they're both happening in Jerusalem. In fact, you know, Adonijah can hear what's going on at Gihon, you know, with, with uh, uh, Solomon. So what ends up happening there as the, well, it's not uh, Adonijah, who hears this celebration that's Joab. taking place. Joab hears. And what happens with, with Joab? What does he hear? All the noise. He hears all the noise, and what does he do? Wants to know what all the noise What's the noise? About? You know, ask somebody, what's going on? I'm hearing a lot of noise. And what does he hear? Trumpets. Yo, you hear trumpets. What does the, what does the guy he asks tell? Tell him. Solomon. Solomon is now king. David has made Solomon king. He's been anointed. He's fit, sitting on the throne. And people are shouting what? Long live King, Solomon. Long live king, king uh, Solomon. You know, David was a good king. Solomon's going to be a better king. even better. You know, that's what people are doing. Now, the people at Adonijah's party when they get wind of that, what do they end up doing? The guests were afraid. Yeah, they leave. <laughs> so they, start, yeah. They, they leave. They take little doggy bags, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. the food with them, but they leave yeah. because it's bad. 
if you're there for this king party and there's another king there, they just as soon leave. And uh, uh, Donald Trump, now, in the past, we've had all kinds of civil wars, people fighting, this kind of jazz. What, what does a Donald Trump, what does he do? He wants uh, Solomon to swear not to kill him. Well, first, what's the first place he goes? Oh. And, and this is great, because Joab's going to do the same thing. He goes, to the, he goes to the tent, right? And what does he do? <laughs> he grabs hold of the, of the ark. Because the, the idea is if I'm holding on to the ark, they won't drag me out. You're, you're not going to drag me out. It's sort of like asylum. You know, he is claiming asylum. He's holding on. They aren't going to kill him if he's holding on to the ark. It's like running into church. You know, they're not going to kill me in church. You know, so that's where he is. And, and how does, now Solomon is now king, right? How does Solomon respond? Now, he, Adonijah is, is a potential rival, right? I mean, yeah. he's already got a following. He's already, even though he doesn't seem to be like Absalom, he's not forming an army to fight. You know, he's running into a, the temple to beg for his, uh, run into the ark to beg for his life. Um, what does, so Solomon would have every reason to eliminate him. I mean, he serves no function for, for Solomon. He, he, there's nothing good that he's going to provide for Solomon. He's Only bad. Nat chance to try to steal the throne, maybe. Like Absolutely. That. You know, here's a rival. You know, it's not, I think I told you before, one of the things about Herod the Great when he was an old man, you know, the, in the New Testament, the one that killed the children in Matthew the second chapter of Matthew. You know, one of the things King Herod the Great did because he became jealous of his sons, at least the sons he had that were competent. You know, the, the idiots he let stay, but he killed the sons that had the most potential. He made sure they were all executed because he was afraid one of them would, might overthrow him. So he left the idiots behind, the ones that posed no threat, and killed the ones that had potential, you know, to protect himself. That's what Solomon can do, you know. But what does he end up doing with Adonijah? Said you can go home. He says, go home. Now, what does that show about Solomon? What do we see? Because we don't know much about Solomon, because he hasn't played a part in this story. At best, kind of passive part of the story. What do we learn about Solomon here? He carries some of his, David's traits. Okay, he carries some of David's traits. Compassion. In particular, compassion. What else? Wisdom. Wisdom. We're going to find out a lot about wisdom. Certainly confidence. You know, he doesn't feel threatened by, by him, this, this guy. We, you don't, as I read it, it doesn't sound like he's weak like he's afraid. It sounds like he's showing compassion and justice to, to a brother that really had, didn't do anything other than, you know, wanted to, you know, follow a doddering father, you know, wasn't really seeking to take, to take power. Now, at the beginning of chapter two, so we, we get a glimpse into Solomon. Right now, Solomon is now king. If Solomon is king, what needs to happen? David needs, David needs to leave this mortal toil. And that's what he does. Before he leaves this mortal toil, what does he tell Solomon? To be strong okay. and always obey God. Be strong, always obey God. So good advice, even though David didn't always follow it. You know, this is good advice that David is offering uh, Solomon. What else does he offer? Tell Solomon. Um, so in general, be them. good, sh you know, follow the Lord, listen to the Lord, what else? Show kindness to the sons of Brazilla. Okay. And Gilead. Gilead. Okay. 
What else? Yeah. yeah, because they were kind to him. So remember the promises I made. Don't, you know, don't betray the family by going back on promises that I made. What else should he do? He has to kill a couple of people. Yeah, watch out. <laughs> watch out. For, for who? Uh, Joab. Joab. You know, he says, Joab, maybe you don't want Joab to die a natural death. Yeah. You know, now David isn't ordering Joab's execution, but he's telling his son, why, why should his son, um, why might he want to eliminate Joab? Because he would maybe fight for the... Well, he, he certainly could. His loyalty is, is questionable. Yeah. Because even though he didn't go with Absalom, he, he was supporting the, your rival, Adonijah. What else does the writer remind us in David's speech? The blood is on Joab's hands yeah. on David's Yeah, feet. that Joab did some things that, that he really shouldn't have done. Particularly to two people with whom David... Two people that could have really helped David in times when David needed it. Joab, for his own reasons, decided to take action. And it's, he doesn't mention Absalom, but he does mention these two, two generals. That, that remember, David was David really could have used. Uh, but Joab, for his own reasons, ended up killing. So you, you may want to settle the score with Joab. Who else is mentioned? Abathar the priest. Okay. Abinathar is, is you, you know, you got to watch him because he backed your brother. So he may not be the one to, you know, to, to trust. What else? Well, David does this last speech to Solomon. To Solomon. What, uh, then what does the writer tell us happens to David? He dies. Okay, Die, he dies, and the writer tells us I'm coming down. after his death what, what will happen to his kingdom. What's the condition in his kingdom? Is his kingdom in good shape when he dies? Yeah. Absolutely. Now, one of the other things that you want to file away, and this is what we're, we're going to continue to see it throughout the books of the Kings, the condition of the country is going to be reflected in the king. If the king is good, the country's in good shape. If the, country, if the king is bad, the country's in bad shape. If the king is righteous, the country is righteous. If the king is evil, the country is evil. So the country is going to reflect the king. Now, that's just the way the writer is going to say. So the king represents the country. So if the kingdom is established and it's solid under Solomon, things are going well. Now, who reappears in verse 13? So David's gone. Solomon is king. Verse thir Adana, chapter 2, 13. And, Adana, Adana, okay. Adonijah shows up again. And what does he do? Kind of pulls a little Nathan. A little bit. Because what does he do? He goes to Bathsheba. And he says to Bathsheba, The kingdom was mine. Well, you know something? Yeah. Um, what, what does he want? Bathsheba, you could do me a favor. He wants a girl. I, I would like you to talk to your son about Abishag. And who is Abishag? He's a beautiful, He's a beautiful young girl that kept David warm. warm. I would like to have her. I'd like to marry her. But your I want your son has got to give me permission. Permission. Okay. And what does Bathsheba do? Now, why is this politically challenging for Solomon? Why is this this a tough situation? Why is that request? more than just a, a young man infatuated by a beautiful young woman. 
Because, because, because of David? Because well, she, she, you know, took care of him. And yeah, okay, okay. He, she, remembered the story of, uh, of Absalom. When Absalom was in Jerusalem and took power, and David's gone. What did, and David left 10 of his concubines back in Jerusalem. What did Absalom do? He took the concubines. And because, and we said, well, that seems kind of odd, you know, but not in this ancient world. By doing that, what was Absalom doing? Declaring his presence or his, his power. power. Yeah, this was, a, this was a power move that people would have recognized. If Abathar takes Abishag as his wife, he's, it could be seen, could be seen as doing the same thing. That this is David's concubine, so he is taking power. He's asserting his power by taking something that belonged to David. Mm -hmm. Just like the kind of authority that was conveyed by Solomon riding David's donkey into, in, into uh, Gihon. You know, this is the same thing. He's, he's taking something that was David's. It's a power. It could be seen as a power play. We don't, we, we don't know, but who thinks, sees it as a power play? Because what does Bathsheba Solomon, Solomon does? Because Bathsheba goes to Solomon and makes a request. And how does Solomon react? He wanted him killed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's not good. She, signed it. she basically signed his death penalty. That's when she, when, well, he, so, yeah. he did it when well, he asked yeah. for it. Uh, but, she, you know, so he's gone now. So these loose ends, you know, now one of them is not loose anymore, right? Kind of, um, as David said in his last um, decree or whatever, mm -hmm. Solomon, each one, and he, he specifically said how they would be put to death. Yep, and so check off. Abisha is, is uh, Adonisha is, is gone. He's gone. Okay. Uh, now, who's next? Yeah, Abathar, the, the priest, right? And what, what happens with uh, Abathar? He sends him back to the fields, uh, his fields in Anathoth. Okay. Because he deserves to die, but he wasn't going to put him to death now because he carried the ark um, for his father David. Okay. So now he is exiled. So we've, we've dealt with one, we've dealt with two, but the big kahuna is Joab. Is, is Joab. Okay. And again, the writer reminds us that he supported Adonijah, but he didn't support Absalom. Okay. Now, evidently, Joab is interpreting the signs, and the signs are not, are not good. <laughs> The, the signs are not good. And so what does Joab decide his best course of action Which is? Stay where he was and he tend not come out. Yeah, he's going to go to the temple. And he's going to hang on. Yeah. Right? And uh, he isn't going to come out. So he is, he's going to be in that, he's going to be in that uh, hanging on to the ark. What does uh, King Solomon Okay, do? let him go to school. Okay. He, he has every right to be in that temple. I respect his right to be there. Abenatha, 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 what should he do? Who is now becoming his right hand man? Kill him. Kill him. Kill him. And, and so what happens? Uh, so he does. In a very dramatic way, because, you know, he says, come out of the tent, and Joab says, are you crazy? There's no chance in this world I'm coming out of this tent, because if I come out of this tent, you're going to, you're going to kill me. And what happens to him? He gets killed in the tent. <laughs> you know, he gets killed anyway. Okay, so now we've eliminated 
three, right? Two dead, one in exile. Now, there's another person that was sort of a, a loose end at Shemira? the end of her. Well, uh, Shema. Shema. And you remember Shema in, in 2 Samuel during the Absalom rebellion? David is leaving Jerusalem, right? And Shema is, is from the tribe of Benjamin. What is he doing as David is leaving Jerusalem, hightailing it out of town? Remember? Oh, Sh- he, he sent for him and told him to build a house. Well, Shema was the one that was throwing rocks, throwing rocks at him oh, yeah, and yeah. cursing him because he was from the house of, he was from the tribe of Benjamin. And who else was from the tribe of Benjamin? Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. And so he doesn't like David because of what David did to Saul. You know, a kinsman. So he was cursing him, throwing rocks at him as David. Now, after this is over, after this little episode and the rebellion is put down, David, Shema comes to David, kind of apologizes, shows great respect, and David forgives him, right? And says that he's not going to seek vengeance against him for for what he did. Okay, so here he is, right? And what does Solomon say to, to Shema? That he could never leave um, and go beyond the Kid, Kid, Kidron? Yeah, and Kidron is, is, again, one of these springs that's right around Jerusalem. You know, so in a, in a sense, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing because David made a promise. And remember, part of the thing that David said to him is you've got to keep the promises I made. And this is a promise David made that Shema was going to be killed. Was going to be killed. So Solomon says, "I'm not going to kill you, right? In fact, what am I going to do? I'm going to give you a house, house in town, right? But, and the but is pretty important. You can't leave town. You can't leave you can't town. Leave. If you, if you leave town, you'll then you'll die. you're going to die. Why are you going to die? They're going to kill. Because I'm the king. <laughs> if you leave town." And Shema says, good deal. Well. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm there. Well. I, you know, I don't have to, I'm not going to, you know, you don't worry. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not an idiot. Uh, well, he's not as smart as he thinks he is because what happens to Shema? Well, three years later, to his, his uh, slaves ran away to the king of God. Okay, so, so we got his slaves run away and go to... God, which is part of the land of the Philistines. That's Philistine land. Uh, that's one of the kings of the Philistines. So he goes there, and what does Shema do? He saddled his donkey and went to kill. Yeah, he goes to get it, to get the slave, right? Mm-hmm. Oops. <laughs> Oops. What happens? He told me he made him a promise he was not to leave. So he wasn't happy. Sorry. Yeah. Didn't you agree to what I said? Yeah. Uh, you, 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 I told you the terms. Mm-hmm. You violated the terms. Now you got to pay the price. And he kills it. So what is, and the writer, we, so we've got these loose ends tied up, right? All these loose ends the writer ties up. And what does the writer, after this, he's struck down, what does the writer tell us about Solomon's kingdom? It was now firmly established. It is now firmly in Solomon's hands. established in Solomon's hands. So what has happened in these first few chapters of, of First Kings? Solomon finished up David's orders. Solomon has finished up and he is now, power has been transferred from David to Solomon. 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 And we get some glimpses of Solomon, you know, that he is capable of showing compassion, that he's smart, that he's just, 
You know, there's justice. He doesn't, he could have killed this guy in, you know, could have killed him in town, you know, but he didn't because he made a promise to his father. And so it was the Shema's, it was his decision that resulted behavior has consequences. You, you do certain things, there are consequences to your behavior, and that's what happens here. So we, we end up with this kingdom now established. David is done. Now we've got Solomon as king. Now we've got to see what Solomon's going to do as king. So we've got this power, power transferred. And that's what we're going to look at next week when we look at chapters, chapter 3 through 518. 3 through 518. We're going to look at Solomon establishing his, his kingdom. Okay? Any any questions? What's that? Did you, where did you say we had to read to? 518. 518. 518. I don't have my... Um, any questions about... At the very beginning this? of this, and they were talking about those who did not follow uh, Ezekiel. Yeah. Uh, there were actually five, and one was Ray, R-E-I. Uh, I'm talking about in verse 8, chapter 1, verse 8. Okay. It says Zadok. Yes, and, yes. Uh, and so, here it shows loyal, loyalty. These people are loyal right. to him. Right. But one turns out to be the fellow that we just talked about. Right, the, the right, right, right. And then there was one other, R-E-I. Right. Have we seen that person before? I don't think so. Okay. I, I don't recall seeing that person, and I don't think we see him again. So I'm not sure why he's there, okay. but I don't I I don't remember seeing. Now I could we could check I could check, no, but okay. he um, kind of they tied him together with the the Shimei. Mm-hmm. There and then it never mentioned him again, and I was kind of wondering about Shimei. I mean that showed his loyalty, but right. then he turned around and, and still violated the law or the, right. Well, and, and you know, it's, it's, I think it's important that he also agreed, you know, so not only was he violating what Solomon the king said, but he violated an agreement that he made. He violated his covenant, you know, from, from Solomon's side, I'm going to let you live. From my side, I will leave the city. And he violated that covenant. And, you know, for Israel, covenants are a big deal. When you violate a covenant, that's, that's, that's pretty important. I just wondered if this rye had any. Yeah, I don't. I, I, that I don't. That I don't know. But it'd be interesting. I may do that just on my own to see if he's he plays a part in the story. I don't think he does, and I don't remember seeing it before. But it it is interesting, uh, and it is interesting that there are five because although that's a perfect number two, you know, sevens and threes are big. So if it was seven, you know, that would reflect something more than just the people if it's three. But the fact that there's five, that, that becomes kind of interesting. So I might look at that and see if, if he's mentioned anywhere else, if he plays a role in the story. Later. Now, Zadok will. Uh, Zadok is going to be big deal. I mean, he is going to be big uh, later in the story. In fact, uh, he's going to be more than Aaron. It's going to be the, the Zadokite priesthood. So the priesthood that's going to be established in the temple will, will be the descendants of Zadok. So he's he become he's going to become really important in the story, even more important in the books of the Chronicles. He's he's a big player in the in the Chronicles. Nathan's kind of kind of coming across like a, a manipulator. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it, not it, something that I always thought Nathan was the prophet. He was right. Well, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. When Nathan goes to David uh, and tells him the story about the, the man and the, the lamb, remember before he does that, when um, they, Nathan doesn't, oh, oh no, no, I'm wrong, different story. When David says, I want to build a temple, Nathan says, Initially, do it. Go ahead. And then God spoke to him, and Nathan said, don't. When Nathan goes in and says the story about the man and the, the sheep, this is something God had, had shown him. That's what the writer says. Uh, it's, it's important for us to remember that these, 
what are the, the, the profits that are here are, are more like royal advisors. That, that's the class. We see prophets as, as people who can see the future, that are prophetic. They're prophetic <coughs> only that, in that they can see the consequences of action. They're like advisors. In fact, there were schools to teach people how to be prophets. You know, like you go to college, you know, to learn how to be a good advisor, to read the signs, to read the lay of the land. And that's what prophets did. When he goes to talk to Bathsheba, there's no mention that God told him to go. He made a decision to go. And he's, that's a shrewd, made a shrewd advisor to the king, you know, does that for its own self-preservation. Uh, so, so yeah, we can, we can kind of cloak him with kind of a spirituality that I don't know that Nathan deserves. And I, I don't think it's reflected in the, in, in the narrative. Uh, Nathan doesn't always act in the spiritual way. Uh, he didn't when he told David to build the temple. God had to correct him. And he sure doesn't when he goes to Bathsheba. But you're right. Nathan, we get this idea that Nathan is, you know, almost pure. You know, he's, he's above, above it all. But he certainly isn't when he goes to talk to, to Bathsheba. We also kind of get the idea, because I've, I've looked at enough portraits as I've put together the studies online, you know, that Nathan is this old, older person that, you know, is a wise prophet. And, you know, he can't be. You know, he's got to be. David's ancient. You know, and Nathan is still functioning. You know, he's, he's you know, engaged in this political game. So it's, it's, it's a little different impression of, of Nathan than I think a lot of Christians have based on what, what they've looked at in Scripture. I don't know that it's necessarily bad because uh, I don't think it does any damage to see Nathan as, as kind of an example, but he isn't, not in, the exa- not in the narrative. I don't think he is. You're going to have lunch. Anything, anything else? Yeah, we got cheese already. I've got cheese for already. Yeah, you've got lunch so, coming. And you had yeah. two big treats. Yeah, and her mom and and Coco's mom is coming home, Ooh. and she gives her treats too. Oh, oh. you could get some more. Yes, yeah, she time. hasn't had any treats since Debbie left. Oh, wow! Because except from Me. Grandma Shirley. Uh, Shirley. Oh, Shirley. Shirley. Why did I say Shirley? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why I said Shirley. That's interesting. There's not even a Shirley here, is there? No. 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 I don't know. Okay. Maybe you have a Shirley in your family. You're no, there isn't a Shirley. <laughs> no, there isn't. I don't know. I've been here three years, by the way. <laughs> yes. Maybe a Shirley is coming along. Shirley. I don't know. I don't know. All right. All right. At least I'm glad I got that recorded. Uh, that's something that's... <laughs> Oh, Oh, Lord, help me. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, thank you so much for giving us this time together and um, help us to, uh, again, take this story seriously and recognize that you you are at work in a story even if your appearance seems very much in the background. This is still your story. Help us to see that and to believe it in the name of Christ. We pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Now Grandma Shelley has to go home.